You're listening to Environmentally Speaking, a weekly podcast diving into legal matters surrounding the environment, public utilities, energy, zoning, and permitting laws in Rhode Island and the surrounding areas. With your host, Marissa Desitel. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Environmentally Speaking. Hi, everybody. I'm Marissa Desitel, an environmental attorney. And I'm Clarice. Usually I come in with questions, comments, and topics, but this week it's even better. I'm coming in with a special guest. I'm here with Bob Roach, a associate curator of science and research. I think it's Rocha. Rocha. Oh, no. Bob, you should know that Clarice has no. many talents. Reading not aloud is close. Not and she should them. know because it's a Portuguese name. Oh, there's no excuse. Fired. Fired from my own. Yeah, do you want to log off and me and Bob can yeah. continue on? Bob, take over. It is yeah. now the Marissa and Bob podcast. <laughs> I'm done. Everybody get, get some mulligan. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bob, for joining us. We are very excited to have you join us and Maya Koopa for the last name, but we're we're really happy to have you come and talk to us about all things whales. Well, thank you for, for the invitation to be here. I'm particularly excited because my office deals with offshore wind projects and one of the most prominent issues that has come out of these projects from my client's perspective are the um, the whale deaths that we're seeing mm -hmm. as a result of the offshore wind activity. That's kind of the position that that I've heard. So I'm excited to hear what your opinion is on that. Yeah, there's certainly um, lots of threads or um, hypotheses to why this is taking place. Mm. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that this um, unusual mort mortality event in which an unusual number of whales are dying started happening and it was labeled as such in 2016 mm -hmm. before any kind of sighting, testing, and those kinds of activities were taking place. Yep. Um, and we can also keep in mind that because we've done a good job of protecting certain species, especially um, the humpback whale, and what 10 of the 14 recognized populations of humpbacks around the planet have been taken off the endangered species list. So we have more whales. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the ocean's warming up a little more quickly than it had been um, in terms of like when certain temps hit at certain latitudes, if the food is coming up earlier, the whales are starting to follow. So we may have more whales. So there's more whales. There are more whales slightly earlier in the year because these are migratory animals, baleen whales that have fairly predictable migrations. And then you, um, and there's all this shipping along the coast. It's a, it's a recipe for animals to get harmed in. Yeah. Quite a few of the necropsies that have been done for these whales have shown blunt force trauma some sort of collision with ships. Yep. There are some, I haven't seen the results or the results haven't been published. So it's, you know, it's hard to know what's, what's killed those. I think it's too easy for certain people to just blame it on sighting of turbines. And you, you certainly can't blame it on the turbines and the platforms because they're not there yet. You can't blame it on something that, do, you know, that doesn't exist. But I've noticed that those that are screaming the loudest to blame it on the turbines and say, let's stop, let's re-examine, are well-funded by the uh, petroleum industry, which is ironic in some regards, because they're also some of the folks that, that are investing money in offshore wind. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the, the immediate clear understanding of um of the species itself would you bob would you say that you'd consider yourself an expert and if so could you give us a little background about why you might an be an expert, expert on what whales and and where you're working and what what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis i would say i've become very well versed on 
the questions that people ask a lot because I work here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, been here almost 19 years. Wow. Um, you know, I'm mostly involved in, in education here, but have become a part of our curatorial department as of a couple of years ago. And in an exhibit we opened in 2018, right in our lobby, was designed to answer the questions people ask. They'll walk in, they see three really big skeletons, blows their minds because these things are so big. You've got a 66 foot blue whale and a 49 foot North Atlantic right whale and a 37 foot humpback whale. And it leads to a lot of questions, whether the front desk gets the questions, my coworkers get them, the volunteers that are here get them, and they all get passed along. And eventually I'm, I'm the one who has to either answer them or provide the, the information to the docents in the front desk to answer them. And we decided, well, let's, let's make an entire exhibit to answer those. And there is certainly an extra focus on the North Atlantic right whale because it's such a highly endangered species. And also because we host the annual meeting of the North Atlantic right whale consortium just about every year. And if it's not here, it's it's usually up, up in uh, Nova Scotia. And I think the other thing that I've become really well versed on is, is industrial whaling in, in the 1900s. So I co-authored a paper with a couple of others about the number of whales killed in the 1900s by industrial whaling. So, you know, the factory ships, you know, mechanized vessels, as opposed to the vessels that sailed out of this harbor until 1925. You know, that, you know, we, we consider that Yankee whaling, whaling under sail, all wind and muscle power, as opposed to diesel power, which is an in industrial whaling. I, I hope that that answers the question. Yes, okay. <laughs> it definitely does. Yeah, thank you. You said 19 yeah. years. Just that's about, a, yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. I, a, I never expected to work in a museum, and I never thought I'd be here for 19 years. And I think one of the reasons I'm here is because this place keep, keeps me curious. Like, I haven't left because I learn something new every day. Every day. That's Just amazing. Just every day, and yeah. then I get to do cool stuff like podcasts and TV interviews and radio interviews and 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 as uh, uh, I was discussing with Cl Clarice earlier it's also been a good excuse to improve my Portuguese because I work with some <laughs> folks here who speak Portuguese and, nice. and I joined the Azorian Maritime Heritage Society here and we own three Azorian whale boats and you know we get to expand that culture as well and I and you know and I'll just throw in that's that's another important thread in this museum is that the fact that we not only discuss and show whale skeletons, talk about whale biology and conservation, but this culture, history and art here as well. Listen, you know, because the whaling industry went all around the world and brought all kinds of culture and art back and just really um, interesting things here and there's always something new to learn. I was going to ask, can you give us an example? Of something new that I've learned? Yes. Um, I like that question. Well, I certainly, well, good example would be when I first started here, there were four known species of this worm called Osidax. Osidax is this thing that lands on whales that have sunk to the bottom. And these worms, these things that actually are able to dissolve the oil and whale bones. There were four known species. And since I've been here, I think there's now 23. Because the researchers are able to get down, mostly using either ROVs, you know, remotely operated vehicles, or an autonomous underwater vehicle with camera. And they take pictures or they take samples back and they're able to learn about these really interesting things that break down dead whales i had I, I, that I can, can, you know that makes a lot of sense if something dies in the ocean it's not going to float to the surface it's got to yeah. it's got to go somewhere so of course as an ecosystem it yeah. that makes a lot of sense so there's 23 at least yes at least wow. and I, I just I looked them up yeah it's called oh, o-s-e-d-a-x it means bone devourer 
apparently they're also known as zombie worms. Zombie oh. worms and bone-eating oh. snot flower and other lovely Yeah. Worms. What? That's <laughs> All right, listeners, <laughs> listeners, you have to look them up. They look yeah. very psychedelic. And those red things that you see on them are typically their gills. How big are these? They look really small. I think they're all di different sizes, but I don't know that they get too big. Are we talking inches or feet? Hey, um, inches. Okay. Yeah. That's like a nightmare. It's, if it's not like those deep sea tube worms. Those things are feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And, and um, another thing that I learned as the result of my paper um, is that we, there were in the 1900s, we killed 2,894,040 whales. And those are the ones that we know about. And those are the big species. And, and that paper doesn't include orcas, other dolphin species, beaked whales, porpoises. It's just the big whales. And from, from what, um, how did they die? How were they killed? They were caught by diesel pirate ships. And for a while, they were processed at sea, or they were dragged across to a shore factory. But then starting in 1925, 1924, the first floating factory ship was created. And you could bring a, you know, so the diesel catcher boat would go get the whale, bring it back to the factory ship, and then they would just pull this whale up the slipway out of the ocean. And then the entire whale would disappear. And we just turn it into a whole variety of products wow um, and so because yankee whaling again wind and muscle power could basically catch the three species of right whale bowhead whale humpback and sperm and the occasionally like pilot whales and that and gray and and gray whales too the whales that were slow enough for dudes rowing to be able to catch they, never, they really didn't go after blue, fin, say, minky, brutus whales. So when factory ships started, they were dealing with full-on populations. Mm -hmm. So in the early days of going after those species, they were killing thousands. And it sounds like it wasn't just an issue of speed, but it was also the idea of if it's like you were saying, this these Yankee boats, it was also the idea of once these people caught the whales, all of the men who were powering the boat then had to stop powering the boat to process what they've caught. And that was after they had rowed the whale back to the ship. So you get the same crew of people hunting, rowing it back. And if there had only been one boat in the water, then there were other men on the ship that could take over the process of flensing and trying out the whale. But it was still, it was all human power and complex machines doing all, all work. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the factory ships, it was all mechanized. And I remember one quote as I was working on the paper um, from a publication. This, and this was from like the 1930s. A guy from the Coast Guard had been on a ship as a spotter. And he said, yep, they could take a 90-foot whale and make it disappear in 90 minutes. Does anyone else get upset about that? <laughs> it's just me. I think I'm. <sighs> it's it's oh, mind blowing to you know uh, to think about how quickly we were pulling these you know just populations of whales out of, out of the ocean. Yep. And it was obviously for you know for economics, and it took a while for people. It took decades to realize we're just going to like totally obliterate. Yeah. All these species. And so like even when the International Whaling Commission started in the 40s, it was created not to protect the whales, but to protect the industry. Like, how can we do this sustainably so mm -hmm. the industry can continue? Its focus has changed over the years. Yeah. Um, like 1931, I think the member, you know, the whaling nations, all right, we're going to stop going after bowhead whales. In 35, they decided, okay, we're going to stop going after right whales. In 66, it was blue whales. I think 65 were humpbacks. 
and there have been some others, I think in the early 70s, gray whales. Um, and I don't know that it was much, much of an economic harm to them to stop going after those species. I think they weren't, they, you know, they really weren't finding any of them anyway. And as I found out in the research I was doing with my two co-authors that the Soviets especially were lying about what they were catching. No. They would say, we got this Get number out. of these things when it was act like they say, it was this number of humpbacks <laughs> when they're actually getting fin and say mm. whales and other things they weren't supposed to be catching. And they were killing undersized and <clears throat> all of that. Bob, what is the name of the article that you authored? And if our listeners wanted mm. to read it, where could they find it? So it's called Emptying the Oceans, a Summary of Industrial Whaling Catches in the 20th Century, and is published in NOAA's Marine Fisheries Review in 2014. Okay. I'll write that down. I was going to say, Clarice, maybe drop that into the show notes yeah. if you can. Yeah, great. And my co-authors who have much more experience with this, especially Yulia, because she's originally from like an hour away from Moscow. So not only does she understand whaling, she understands the language. Yeah, that's and helpful. she was able to <laughs> communicate with several Russian biologists who were on these ships and kept accurate records at risk to their own lives, while wow. they had another set of books for what was going to get reported to the International Whaling Commission. So Yulia and Phil um, had these conversations with these people. It's uh, pretty important you know, pretty impressive what they were able to do. And there's a movie called The Witness is a Whale. And I know some some of those interviews are in that movie too. The Witness is a Whale. Yes. And, uh, we're going to write that down the, too. The, the yeah. two folks who made that, Nick and Cheryl Dean, Nick and Cheryl, D-E-A-N, Dean, came out here and I interviewed with them for hours. And unfortunately, all of it got cut and I didn't make the movie, but what they, you know, what the finished product is for the film is really, really good. Um, they, you know, they interviewed Phil, they interviewed Yulia, and they interviewed a couple of these, at least one of these Russian biologists. And, uh, you know, that helps to tell a story about in industrial whale hunting. And if there, if there is any particular message that you would want our listeners to know about the museum and the work that you're doing every day, what would it be? Hmm. I'll say a couple of things. Um, I probably said this 500 times. The museum suffers from its name, New Bedford Whaling Museum, because we're much more about whaling and dead whales and dead people. Uh, it, you know, we really, it's arts, history, science, and culture. And um, I think we we do a great job of not only using the science to talk about what's happening now and get out a conservation message, but the history part of what we tell, you know, the arts, the history, and the culture as they tie into not only the whaling industry, but also the region, because we started in 1903 as the old Dartmouth Historical Society with the biggest story being whaling. Um, I would say that if you want to learn about a variety of things, come to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. People walk out of here pleasantly surprised 99% of the time. You know, we had one review from one family that looked up and saw the skeletons and felt very sad and left. I can understand that, but I will say that the skeletons we have did not come to us as the result of the whaling industry. Two of them were ship strikes recent, you know, one 1998, one 2004. The sperm whale who's in a different gallery. We don't know why he died, but he washed ashore in Nantucket in 2002. He may have had decompression sickness. And then the humpback skeleton, that one's from 1932. He was a young one. He was only three years old. And we're not sure why he died either. Although there was one clue and it was be his tongue was missing. And there is a species of dolphin that likes wow. to rip out the tongue of its victims. Come on. What? Orca. The orca. Dolphins are like so sweet. And But orcas, or orcas are the largest species of dolphin. And that's one hint that they've been around. They like to rip. The t it, there's a whole lot of that's muscle awful. and meat and energy. <laughs> really? right there. And there's no bone in the way. right? Ugh, Bob, that's gross. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> what a it's great like a, story. It's a I dolphin know. delicacy. Yeah. And you know what it's and we don't see orcas out here much. It was it was a big deal three or four weeks ago that there were four orcas seen off Nantucket. It was a whale watch boat or a charter fishing boat out there. And there were, you know, four of them swimming across in a line, like, you know, as if they're lined up to run a race or swim yeah. a race. Yep. Swimming along. And we rarely see them out here. Wow. They're around every once in a while. And there's one I think it's been nicknamed Old Tom who will just show up. Anybody have any tongues? Hmm? So, did anybody have any tongues? Just mm -hmm. like little souvenir in the fin? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that that's um I just Bob that just made me think of what we started this conversation with where you were saying you've you've been there for 19 years because you learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you yeah. just taught us two things in 30 minutes mm. about I had no idea that dolphins were so brutal. Well, at least that oh, that yeah. one species. Haven't you ever, ways, in many haven't you ways, ever heard of the book why you want to punch a dolphin in the other. face? Say that again, Clarice. As I say, haven't you guys ever heard of the book? I think it's called um, Reasons Why You Should Punch a Dolphin or something like that. <laughs> no, I have not heard of it. I will send it yeah. to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they can be jerks. Yeah. And there's what, 35 or 37 species of dolphin? And, huh. and then, then, then there's the four river dolphins. Yes. Um, what is a river dolphin? River dolphin is one of these, like some people call them pink dolphins. Yep. And they have very long beaks with lots of little sharp teeth and tiny little eyes. They're, freaking they're looking. often in muddy water. So they really rely on, um, um, you know, on their ability to echo locate to find their food. And, you know, they're not that big and they don't really have a dorsal fin so much as they have a hump, like a ridge. Okay. So they don't roll over. Um, and since I started here, there was one species that's been declared functionally extinct. And that was the one in the Yangtze river. It was called the Baiji, B-A-I-J-I. -I. And in 1980, I think they, they knew about like 400 of, of them in the river. And by 2004, 2006, they would, they couldn't find any, mm. Mm. So, you know, and it's pollution, it's yeah, human interference, ac accidental kills, purposeful yep. kills, mis misuse of the habitat, all mm -hmm. those things. Yep. Yep. So I do have to circle back. Bef okay. Earlier when we were talking, you had said that there was a myth about the right whale's name. Yes. And it's it sounds like a personal mission to dispel that myth. It's a mission. What is, what is the myth? Okay. I so need the, to know. The myth is that the right whale is called the right whale because it was the right whale to hunt because they live close to the coast and they're slow. And when, and when you, and they're so blubbery that when you kill them, they float and, you know, and that helps you with your turning the whale into money. The thing is, and, and I can't, and I have to say, I have a coworker here who's done more reading on this than I have. And he's the one who's dragged me into it willfully, by the way. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you go back and you think about the name right whale, the bowhead whale used to be referred to as the Greenland right whale. The North Atlantic right whale used to be referred to as the black right whale. The scientific name Eubalina glacialis means true whale or right whale. Is and that's there any the wrong whales? Name for the for the right whale. Yeah, those are the ones that get hit that get hit by the boats. <laughs> or they do but they do badly on uh news quizzes. <laughs> and really the right with the right part of it had much more to do with the baleen in their mouths. This was the right whale to hunt for commercial purposes because of the baleen. So bowhead whales can be enormous, like 60, 65 feet long and tall enough that the baleen that's in their mouth is like 14 feet tall. Oh my God. Because they because humpbacks and blue whales and fin whales, they have like flat upper jaws. Whereas the three species of right whale and the bowhead bowhead, their upper jaw is arched. So think of it as like half of a, of, of a McDonald's sign. 
Mm -hmm. And because they are arched, there's more room in the mouth. And it's just, you know, the shape of the animal. And they don't have dorsal fins, which is a pr major problem for them with not being seen because they come up to breathe or to feed near the surface and there's no fin visible. Yep. But these animals, so the bowhead baleen could be, you know, 12, 13, 14 feet tall. And it was considered of better quality than right whale baleen for the market. And this was back before people invented plastic. You know, baleen is basically mother nature's plastic. And you can, because it's flexible and pliable and you can use it in corsets and hoop skirt frames and collar stiffeners and whips, um, mattresses, all kinds of interesting things, goggles, um, umbrellas, parasols. So the right part of the right whale refers as much to the baleen as it does to anything else. And yes, right whales are found near the coast and they're blubbery and, you know, so are bowheads, at least in terms of blubbery. Bowheads more likely to float than a right whale. I ask, like, if you look at the, the logs of going after North Pacific right whales, especially in the 1800s, between 1840 and 1880, when we almost wipe, wiped them out, a lot of these animals sank. They may refloat later once gases start to build up as they're starting to uh, decompose, mm -hmm. but they didn't always float. And if you get, and once you harpooned one, they re, they respond really violently. And there's nothing right about that for a guy who's in a thirty foot boat. You ask people that are working on current disentanglement of whales, and they all and they all say trying to disentangle a humpback is a whole lot easier than trying to disentangle a right whale because the right whales get really skittish and they don't respond well to getting in close with the zodiac. So all that together, the, calling them the right whale for all those other, other reasons really doesn't work. The right part of it had to do with the fact that they had baleen and they were the right ones to get for the market. And it's more attributable to bowhead whales than it is to right whales. Yep. Because in other parts of the world, they're the Nord Caper. They have all these other names that I don't even remember because they're foreign words. And like in Portuguese, Baleia Franca is how you would call a right whale. I, it, Clarice is, has a big smile on her face right now. <laughs> and I think... I'm just the, giggling. I just love... Bo, the, I, and the bowhead in Portuguese is either Baleia Arctica or Baleia Polar, because I know the... the the polar bear is Ur Ursa Polar. And we just had an exhibit here on polar, polar whale. Yeah. Basically. I just mm -hmm. love the word whale in Portuguese. Balea. Balea. Yeah. Like, it just sounds goofy. Except for sperm whale. It's, I don't it, know that one. Uh, it's cachalot. <laughs> and that's well, almost that's the same awesome. as the French word. The French put an E on the end of it. The German word for whale is better. It's val. Like the sperm whale is the pot muscle. That, that just sounds angry, which doesn't well, surprise us no, as it's Germans. a whole other topic. Yeah. <laughs> For another day. Hey, speaking uh, of myths, can I can I get at one other thing? And it's 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 more of a mislabeling, or it's like a let's call it this because it'll grab people's attention. And that's when a, someone like you know, like a lobsterman or a fishman ends up in a whale's mouth and they say, Oh, it got swallowed. It didn't get swallowed. The guy, whoever ends up in the whale's mouth, is in the whale's mouth, but he didn't go down the throat. Because there's only one whale with a throat big enough to swallow a person, and that's a sperm whale. So I love to tell groups, you know, especially if there's like 10, 12 people, I said, okay, if we were all happy, like we could all have this conversation in a blue whale's mouth, and it couldn't <laughs> swallow any of us. Because the blue whale's throat's only the size of a basketball. What? Because they're they're eating small food. Yeah, they don't need to have a huge throat. Whereas yep. sperm whales are okay, eating that makes squid sense. that might be three, four, five, ten feet long. And contrary to popular belief, sperm whale don't just eat giant squid. They'll eat whatever squid's available. And there's 300 species of squid in the ocean. That's so something does, that I see. That's one of those things that I learned while here on the job that there are 300 different species of squid. And like does with the, the right person whales, never leave the mouth? 
Mm-hmm. If a if a person goes into a whale's mouth, mm-hmm. first off, stay on land. If a person never <laughs> if a person goes into a whale's mouth, what do happens? they just never leave the mouth? No, they get spit. Or like, do they though. go? No, no, no. I mean, eventually, because they're telling the story. But like, yeah. <laughs> do they just like roll under the tongue for a minute? I hope like, not. Where are they hanging out? They're probably sitting on top of the tongue, just you know, probably you know, like hold, holding on onto the baleen, so they so their feet don't get stuck in the throat. I don't know, but you know. It, wait, this is a real like thing. This happens. Yes. So oh, yes. A, you've never heard this story. Just off the no. coast. If it wasn't last summer, it was 2021. Yeah. I was fishing and he ended up in a humpback whale's mouth. Yeah. And he got coughed back back up. And it was a couple of kayakers just a month or two ago off the what? West Coast, I think, ended up That's in a wild humpback's mouth. But the whale can't swallow these people. I talked about this for days. Wow. Remember no, I'd never that heard that. Blue whale, a full grown blue whale's mouth when like when you expand out the throat pleats, it's big enough to hold two full grown elephants. They wow. can so when those throats expand, they the, the volume of water in that in that throat is equal to the volume of the whale itself. What? But then they use those throat muscles to push all the water through the baleen and out so they can just swallow the krill, or in the case of the right whales, the copepods. And oh my God, and the throat is only a basketball. Yeah, for a blue whale. That's and that's and actually one of one of the little tools we have when we got school groups coming through, we have this cardboard ring and we wrote and they wrote like blue whale throat diameter and we'll put it over a kid's head, but it's it doesn't go past the shoulder. Well, Bob, this is my new nightmare. nightmare. Funniest thing, huh? (laughs) This is my new nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna have to come check this museum out. This place sounds awesome. And we take up a whole city block too. We have like twenty, yeah, I've been by galleries. Yeah, I've been by it. Yeah. So are you there um, seven days a week, Monday through Friday? Mm-hmm. What's your schedule? My schedule is typically during the week, you know, typically the weekdays. Um, but we're, we're open seven days a week. In, in the winter, we'll close on Mondays in January, February and March. Yep. OK. Um, and <sighs> for all of you Moby Dick enthusiasts, we do a nonstop 25 hour reading of Moby Dick on the first weekend in January that doesn't involve January 1st or 2nd. And that's because when Herman Melville sailed out of this harbor in 1841, he sailed out January 3rd, 1841 on the first voyage of the whale ship of Kushnet. And his experiences there and his experiences talking to other people, including the grandson of Owen Chase, who was on the Essex when that got rammed and sunk by a whale in 1820, um, led to him writing Moby Dick, which was not a very popular book when it came out. And now it's insanely popular. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, again, 25 hours nonstop people, five or 10 minute blocks of time reading yep. the book. And Clarice, we also do a Portuguese mini marathon of about <laughs> four hours. Because we. The How pre- many times can you hear Balea? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got. Oh, you know, no, I have it right here. I've got the Portuguese full version of it. But we also commissioned, we meaning the like two previous Portuguese consuls to New Bedford commissioned an artist to cut Moby Dick down into three hours and 45 minutes. And then we read that. We have like everybody gets a five minute piece of the book. We just one after another reading in Portuguese. There we go. And no we descriptions. Zoom, no, and we zoom in with people in Fayal, Lisboa, Cabo Verde, and um, Tocedo. Very cool. And we, well, the same, and we turn off the audio and we just keep the video on. So call me Ishmael in Portuguese. Tratem-me por Ismael. <laughs> <laughs> well, listeners, you can join New Bedford Whaling Museum mm-hmm. in two languages. Yes. I love this. Well, Bob, thank you so much. I've got new nightmares. I've learned new facts. I don't think I'm going to ever learn how to swim. Um, it was on my bucket list. But I'm oh, gonna... you should. No. I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know stay on that. land, Clarice. Yeah, you I'm going to You got enough problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast has renewed new fears in me of chickens yeah. in the ocean.
Did you say chickens? Oh yeah, that was another podcast episode. Oh, yeah. oh okay. It's a long story. Yeah, it is. Bob, thank <laughs> you so much for your time. I really enjoyed chatting with you and I right. will absolutely come in and visit yeah. and I will uh, ask if you are available to say hello. Please do. Thanks again. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. If you have any questions, comments, um, want to tell us what you've learned from this episode, write in at help at desatelesq.com. We are on the socials at Desatel Law on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can catch our videos on YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Environmentally Speaking. If you're in need of an environmental attorney, we are here to help. Call us at 401-477-0023 or visit our website at www.desatellaw.com. That's www.desatellaw.com.